I made another big mistake this week. And um, I'm always doing that, you know. And, and fortunately, I will give my wife credit on this. Um, fortunately, my wife doesn't point them all out, okay? Because I think she said before, you know, it's because then she would never get to do anything. She'd just have to be listing out my sins. But we were sitting down talking just a couple of days ago. And, um, again, when, when you're in ministry, you, you, you're around a lot of hardship stuff, okay? I mean, I, I really couldn't explain to you what I see sun up, sun down. But it was, it was just kind of at that point in the week where you're like, you know, um, you ain't give up, but you give out, okay? And she just looks at me, and she's like, listen, what are you preaching this Sunday about? I said, hardships. She said, well, when you get past this one, you better, pray ne- you better preach next week message called Blessing, Blessing, Blessing. So I can't promise you that that's what's going to happen next week. But I'm thinking about it, okay? All right. So if any of you got any ideas you want to text me about, of why I should, uh, you know, have a message called Blessing, Blessing, Blessing. But today, we're about to get into the trenches, okay? We're going to get into ditches. Uh, you know, you don't have to live long or read or know much about the Bible to understand that this world is full of hardships, amen? amen. The world's full of hardships. The older you get, the more you, you, you that's just confirmed. And then we have, a, we have another area that I think um, our venue that makes things even feel more than they've ever been, and that's called social media, okay? And so, so whether it comes through the television or comes through your phone or computer, what happens now is this. Um, not only do you know all of your hardships and everything you're hearing going on in your hometown or in your state or in your country, but you got Bubba in Timbuktu telling you, hey, pray for me. I got this going on, okay? Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people that, that you know, anything that somebody's struggling with and I hear about, you know, I care about, even if I didn't know the person. You know, you don't, you don't want somebody to not feel loved. You don't want somebody to not, um, uh, you know, have somebody reach out to them. And so we, we're well aware that, that chaos abounds, hardships abound everywhere. You don't need to ask somebody if they're going through something. You just need to say, how you doing? And uh, is there any way that I can pray for you uh, today? You know, um, I, I, was, I was looking up some, some stats on some things just to think and get your mind thinking on this. You know, every minute, 106 people die in this world, okay? Every minute. Every minute, between 6 to 14 people starve to death. Every minute, 14 people get in a car accident. Some live, some don't make it. I've been hit head on by a drunk driver before and had nothing but, a, um, but, but, but an airbag and come out and, and, and no doors open except my driver's door. Each of us can think of things that we have gone through or things that we've heard others go through. And, and listen, each of us are going through something right now in our lives and, 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 and as well as all those around us. And we need to understand, listen, I want you to write this down. You can't prevent hardships, but you can let God change your perspective of hardships. I really believe the strongest transformation that happens to me and to you is to get a different perspective than just seeing the hardship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, open our eyes that we might see what you want us to see. Open our ears that we might hear what you want us to hear. And Lord, open our hearts that we might, Lord, receive what it is you want us to receive and believe it, God. Lord God, we give you this service today. May we not just be informed, but may we leave transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Scripture does say in Romans 12, too, I believe it is, um, you know, it is through the renewing of your mind that you will understand God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Sometimes we can't see the goodness for the madness, okay? It's really hard to do. It's really, it's really hard for somebody to, to just be thinking, praise Jesus, when they just had the most devastating loss they've ever experienced. Or they're in the midst of the, the most paranoid moment they've ever been in. They just feel, you know, like, man, you know, everything's ruined. What's going on? But what we need to realize is this. What is God doing or wanting to do in the hardship, through the hardship? I'm going to share with you five ways that God uses hardships, but I want you to understand this message can be a little bit different than normally that I preach. 
Uh, God made me go in and just start deleting a bunch of notes this morning. And I was like, well, God, you're getting me nervous now. He's like, no, I, 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 he, he, this is what he put on my heart. He said, Craig, this isn't a message that you have to look at notes for. This is a message I put in your heart. This is a message that, that you've, you've had to receive and are having to receive and that you have had to live and you're having to live. And, that's, and so I want to share that with you. I want you to understand everything I'm going to share with you today, it is going to be an absolute faith lift if you believe it. Number one, the way that God uses hardships is to wake us up spiritually. God uses hardships to wake us up spiritually. Now, I can hear somebody right now going, well, I, I had something, though, Pastor, happen, and I was already awoke spiritually. Well, maybe it wasn't about just waking you up. Okay? See, some things, some things you can deal with directly that still, um, through you, it has indirect um, uh, impact. Other things happen indirectly, happen to somebody else, but somebody you care about, and it speaks volumes to you. Listen, when a thir- certain thing happens in our lives that, that we feel like is a, it's like a sudden bomb that went off and nothing but chaos, I want you to hear this. And, and I want you to write notes anything, anytime you hear something that God's just wanting you to hear. God is not sleeping in the midst of the hardship. Instead, he's screaming. He's screaming. He's not, he's not silent. He's not sleeping. He is screaming. God is saying, listen, will you give me your full attention now? I believe the greatest tragedy that happens from the greatest tragedies is when people learn nothing from it and nothing changes because of it. You need to realize that sometimes that life is short. I, I've only had one week, I think, in the last nine, ten weeks that I haven't had a funeral. Life is short. So, see, I get I get our front row view. Um, uh, I, I've been before um, counseling somebody's marriage. I'll never forget one time I was counseling somebody's marriage several years ago, and, and um, I just abruptly said, hey, I got to go home. They're like, why you got to go home? You know, we just started. I said, because I need to go home and apply what I was talking to you about. And so I went home. Sometimes you have a wake-up call. Sometimes you see something happen in somebody else's life, and you realize it can happen in your life any moment, any minute. In case you don't know me well, I'm just not somebody that cares to not live with a sense of urgency. In fact, I believe if you're not living like you're dying, you're not living. You can go ahead out there, like I tell you, like um, Tim McGraw says, you go ride yourself a bull and everything else you want to do. But I'm not going to, listen, I'm not going to let myself get caught up in bull and baloney and miss what God has for me with whatever brief time he has left for me. And so, so that, that's, that's just where my wake-up call gets. I, I've seen enough wake-up calls, you see? And plenty of it I saw in people's lives like yours, and it helped my life, okay? God doesn't just want to physically wake you up. He wants to spiritually wake wake you up. Listen, the greatest battle, I want you to write this down, the greatest battle you will ever face and that you always face is a spiritual battle. You cannot beat a spiritual battle with just physical tactics. You need the Lord. You need the Spirit. You need the prayers. You you need the truth. Ephesians 5, 14 through 17 says, this is why it is said, wake up sleeper. There's somebody right now that you came to church or you were about to nod off and God's saying, listen, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You see two things that, that Scripture's telling you right there. First of all, wake up. Don't put your faith on cruise control. Don't be complacent that where you what you did yesterday is, is where you need to be today. God's constantly moving us, leading us, guiding us. We have to keep following So he doesn't just want to wake us up and be like, man, you saw what I just did. He's going, no, I want you to respond to it And the response is, okay, Lord, what is your will? Because obviously I'm not in control. 
God, what is your will? Because my ways can't have the same impact as your will. But secondly, God uses hardships to draw us closer to him. God uses hardships to draw us closer to him. How does that happen? You have a big enough heartache, and you'll get on your knees. Nothing hurts more than when it's on your own backyard. God's not looking to just beat you up and ruin and rain on your parade. He's wanting to wake you up, and he's not trying to distance himself from you. He's actually trying to bring you closer. And if we're honest, because I've seen this all throughout my ministry, most people come to see me or come to see anybody else, for that matter, at a church after having dealt with a crisis or being in a crisis, after a bomb went off. Listen, you can't tell me that it's not um, on the, on the edge of, of absolute brokenness that leads you to pray more, that leads you to read more of the Bible, that leads you to go to church, that leads you to genuinely begin to give your life completely over to Christ. Listen, there's never a hardship that God has attached to you that he is not wanting it to turn you to him. Look at Romans 2, 4. It says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can you can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? Some of you, every day you wake up, you know good and well that you're, it's a miracle that you're still living because of something that happened to you. It is a miracle and a blessing that God has still allowed you time to get it right. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience, it leads us away from sin and results in salvation. I, I typically, at most funerals I do, I don't usually give an altar call. It was in the cards for God to do that with with the 31-year-old uh, lady that I did a uh, funeral for this past um, uh, Friday, uh, God had just led to do an invitation. Several souls came to Christ. Several souls rededicated their life. And to be honest, that's the only reason I do that stuff for. I had, I, it is going to sound crazy. I'm just telling you just because I get, I'm just an honest, try to be an honest person. I, I prepared almost 21 hours this week for that one funeral. I don't think I planned more than six, seven hours for my own daddies. But sometimes God just tells you, hey, this is bigger than you. Lean in. In fact, I was so wore out, I was like, man, it's Friday night, and I still got to be complete on what in the world I'm preaching to these people on Sunday. And my, me and my wife, we'd often say this. We're like, listen, you know they got that Sunday thing again. In case you want to know what it's like being a preacher, you're like, my God, is there a Sunday in every week? <laughs> and yes, it is. Yes, it is. You know, I'm, listen, I'm glad once I get here, but I'm telling you, I'm very much like that, um, that, that individual that um, said, um, hey, you know what? His mama woke him up, said, listen, you need to get to church. And he said, why? And she said, number one, I said so. And number two, you're the preacher. <laughs> okay. God, thank you so much. I try to ask God. I, I believe it or not, I try to ask God. I say, listen, sometime in the course of the, of the um, message, uh, give me something that'll make somebody laugh so I can laugh with them. So I'm laughing with you, not at you, okay? Um, I want you to hear me. It is always God's will through the roughest stuff to not only get people closer to Christ, but, get, but, but for somebody to come to Christ. See, today... As we look out, and I can't see all of you because of the lights, but I can see enough of you. If you're not saved in this place, God, God's calling you. God's saying, listen, if not now, when? If not now, when? If, if, you, if you aren't going to give your life to Christ and turn from sin and repent of sin and, 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 turn to, and, and believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life after this has happened or after this is happening or after you've heard this gospel presentation well, when are you going to do that? He says there's, there's no regret 
for that kind of sorrow the, 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 when, you, when you have true repentance. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. It's not enough to go through stuff if the stuff doesn't get you where God wanted you to go. Your aim in life should be this. This is, this is the number one thing that I want God um, to, to, to make real in your life if, uh, when I die. I've been trying to plan my funeral, even though I'm not trying to look at ways out, okay? The first thing I want people to say is that he walked with God. Because if you can't say I walked with God, then I, I didn't get to accomplish the will of God. To accomplish the will of God, listen, to experience God's best in your life, I don't care what it is, you got to put your little hand in his big hand, and you got to humbly walk with God. Until you choose to do that, you can be sitting right there doing just what other people do in church and just getting full of, full of Scripture and sassy. Well, I, I mean, listen, so many people can quote Scripture, but God's not looking just to see how many Scriptures you can quote. God's looking for, for how, many, how much surrender he can have of a person. I've said this before. Most pastors, to be honest with you, they're way smarter than me. I really would get, I'd tell you that in a heartbeat. They're way smarter than me. But the difference sometimes, as I told one pastor, I said, is, is I understand I can't do it, and I understand I'm not meant to do it. I understand that he does it through me and despite me. So as I'm up here, I just want you to understand God's just wanting to pipeline through me. I'm just an instrument letting his, his word, letting his spirit lead to you. But God is calling each of us to grow closer. Today, God wants you closer than you were yesterday. Tomorrow, when Monday comes around, don't just treat it as another Monday. Approach it like you did Sunday, seeking to take a step towards God instead of just kind of going on your own way. But thirdly, God uses hardships to grow our faith roots. God uses hardships to grow our faith roots. Many people claim faith. Many people. But there's no evidence. And there's no, not been enough testing in their life. Listen, the more you go through and seek God by faith, the more you grow in your faith. The only way that you grow roots in your faith is to go through stuff. You show me somebody who has a genuine but really like extraordinary faith, and I'll show you somebody who's been through something that, that would take the average person out. But they've learned that even in that, they could trust God. Listen, I thank God for anything I've ever gone through. There's nothing I've gone through up to this point in life that I don't genuinely thank God that I went through it because I understand I had to go through all of that to get where I am today. Colossians 2, 6 through 7 says, And now, just as you accepted Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Verse 7, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. I pray nowadays for my boys often, whereas I would admit in a heartbeat, I, 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 didn't, I didn't pray as much in my younger days. You know how it is with your kids. You kind of grow up with them. A lot of your parents understand me. Um, we was, I was, um, I was, what, 24 when we had the first one, 26, and then 28. And so my youngest, um, he's, he's just kind of got the best of daddy. Maybe that's why you're Asher Craig Crosby, right, buddy? He just kind of got a little different side of daddy. In fact, I think some of the boys at one time, they're like, do you love anybody other than Asher? I'm like, well, unfortunately, you reach that age of adolescence, which is really a, another word for alien, or alienation, I mean. Um, I think God allows the adolescent stage just so that we're okay with parting ways and periodically visiting, okay? But... Um, but, but I, I pray for my, my kids, and what I pray is, number one, that they all truly come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, and I also pray that they will become 
and accomplish everything that God created them to. And here's why that's a hard prayer to pray. Because you have to be willing to accept that God oftentimes has to allow hardships to get them there, just like it happens in your life and my life to get us here. But I want you to hear me. In, in your, in your um, time of hardship, it's not that God's working part-time. He's working full-time. I always say he's doing more when he got you in the workshop than ever before because he's working on you. And he wants to work in and through you. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I think about those who, who maybe you're, you're, you're a runner and you, you run a couple miles a day or what have you, you don't just start out one day. You know, trust me, if I ran a mile with you right now, first of all, I'd fall down one-third of the mile just because of health conditions that I deal with. But, but listen, you can't build that endurance to run three to five miles a day overnight. You got to keep building that endurance, and that's the same with your faith. Your faith can't grow forward when you're not taking the next right step. By the way, it's not about where this is headed or trying to figure out the future. If you can figure it out, please let me know because I don't have a crystal ball either. But I know this much. God wants me to do today, realize this is the day the Lord has made, do everything I possibly can to hear from him, listen to him, obey him, and trust him. And he builds the endurance. Any, any strength that you ever hear out of me, because trust me, I can preach stronger sitting down now than I can standing up. Standing up actually wears my body completely out. But God, 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 y'all, how many of you know what I'm talking about? When you get an inner faith strength that you just know is a renewed strength from God because you got pressed a little harder and you had to lean in a little bit further. And fourthly, God uses hardships to comfort others through us. This is when it gets beyond just us. I want you to hear this. God uses hardships to comfort others through us. When you know what it's like to, to struggle financially, when you know what it's like to battle a life-changing health issue, when you know what it's like to experience marriage struggles or divorce, when you know what it's like to see your family um, fall apart or to feel abandoned by your family, when you know what it's like to lose a loved one, when you know what it's like to lose a job that you thought was your security, when you know what it's like to... to to have your house burned down and you lose everything and you don't know what you're going to do next. Whenever you face hardships of any kind and God comforts you through it, you now have on your resume, you have experience and you should have compassion and a God story to help others facing the same or similar struggles. Listen, whenever I am in any room, because I deal with chronic pain on such an often basis, and it's now just a part of my life, okay? It's just a different way I have to live. I have to account for it every morning, day and night. My wife will tell you, I calculate it all. I even, I, I'm even learning more and more when I truly got to just go like, okay, Craig, you just can't do that, even if that was something enjoyable to you, or, or, or even though you want to help this person or that person. We all have limits, amen? But, but... I actually have realized that the hardship is not a barrier, it's a bridge. I want you to write this down, that your greatest pain is God's greatest platform. Your greatest hardship is your greatest mission. In fact, I believe the healing comes most from getting to see God use your hardship to help others go through their hardship. When it's not used, it's just wasted and feels worthless. 2 Corinthians 1, 4 through 6 says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. 
when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. See, you give them hope. When people see that you've been where they are, but yet you're not there now, and somehow God took you through, they are drawn to that more than they are anything else. Some of you, you, you might be smack dab in the middle of this hardship that you still wish would go away or this nightmare that you still wish would change, but God is positioning you to help other people. And if you choose not to help other people, you will not feel the healing and hope yourself because every time you're sharing it with someone, you're remembering it yourself. You're remembering how God came through. You're confident of how God came through. Verse 5 says, For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. Listen, you might hate what you're going through, but it could be that very hardship that is going to lead to your son or your daughter or your grandchild coming to know Jesus Christ or your spouse coming to know Jesus Christ. Listen, there is nothing greater than a soul being saved. That's why Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice because he's saying salvation is worth it. He says, for when, you, for when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same sufferings we suffer. Listen, if none of us ever had hardships like other people, we couldn't relate. If we didn't have something that we learned in that time and God poured into us at that time, we would have nothing for God to pour through us at this time. I really do live for the day where every care group that evolves in the life of this church, maybe God's speaking to somebody in here, it needs to come uh, being led by a, a, a common ground. It needs to be led by, by somebody who, who has faith but has experienced a certain hardship that many others experience. And so you could come together and you could talk about those things. You could, you could share hope among those things. Because listen, when you lead a group, by the way, it's not that you know everything and it's not that you have every answer or have it all together when it comes to dealing with things. You can struggle and still know the Savior. You can struggle and still help other people who are struggling. In fact, people don't like really to listen to anybody who's not real and who doesn't have real problems while they're seeking a real Jesus. God often has to take you through something to take you to something. And some of you, you might have had something happen years ago. It's not even something of recent. But God's going, hey, I need you to, to let me use this as a mission moving forward. I believe wholeheartedly our greatest pain is God's greatest platform. But last but not least, number five, God uses hardships to elevate Christ above us. God uses hardships to elevate Christ above us. Um, you know, sometimes I, I talk pastor language with y'all just because, again, we all, we all only know the language that we live in, Okay. Each of y'all have professions or situations you deal with that I've never dealt with. But as a pastor um, in a profession that is considered in the top three of most stressful positions a person can have, mainly because culture's crazy, okay, I said it. Culture's crazy. People are crazy because they're like me and you. Um, it's just harder, okay? But I look back, and I remember telling my mom, at least four or five years ago, I said, Mama, I said, by the time, I said, if God keeps leading the way that I'm seeing him lead me and guiding me in his ministry, I'm like, when, when God's done, there ain't going to be nothing left to Craig. I said, there ain't going to be nothing left to me. I said, I want to keep a piece of me. Y'all know how crazy I am. I just want to be Craig. But God was cementing in my heart, remember, what you said, you don't want to build this church on Craig. You want to build this church on Christ. Remember, you have to decrease so that he might increase. And by the way, when you get out of God's way, not only can God take over you, but also you get out of other people's way. And you find it a joy to help them find their way. 
Listen, you ever face something that just absolutely humbles you? I'm, 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 I'm using words I don't even normally use. Um, I, was, I was thinking this. This is country. That slap, slaps the snot out of you. I don't even know if I've ever said that. Mom, if you're hearing that. I don't know if I said that. My mom would be like, that's close enough to a cuss word. Now you're going to lose your testimony. I tried really good to make sure that whatever came out of my mouth sounded okay. You ever have something so God-sized, so exposing of you, that, that just made you feel like, man, man, everybody sees where I'm at. Everybody sees me. I'm just broken. I'm just helpless. I'm just hopeless. And it made it clear to you that there is a God, but you're not him. Listen, God often has to decrease us in order to increase him. In fact, I can tell you this in your walk with Christ. The more you give up to God, the more God takes over. But he can't, he can't take over. He doesn't force himself on you. God doesn't make any of us do anything. Not, we can't make anybody do We can't make one another. All we can do is love, lift, and lead people to the cross. You point people to the cross, you don't push people to the cross, okay? You love them where they are. But you get to a point where, where um, I, I, I picture the times that something has happened catastrophic with someone's child or, or situation, and, 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 and man can't do anything about it. Doctors have said, hey, it's just a matter of time, and, and everybody's praying, Everybody's praying, the community's praying, the, the world's praying, it feels like, and, and you got all that going on, and, 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 but what, the key piece is this, it, you're at desperation. You're at desperation. You're like, God, if you don't do something right now, I can't make it. If you don't, if you don't it, it, God, it, there's nothing we can do. That's obvious to all of us, God. Please, 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 please do something. And then all of a sudden, God actually proves you wrong of what you didn't even believe he could do. And guess what? When God does it, you can't take the glory for it. When God does it, you can't take... Listen, the things that God brings to you and the things that God does through you sometimes are just so, so amazing that all you can do is say, there is a God, and I'm not him. And listen, your testimony, by the way, just as, as we often say, it's not about what you've done. It's about what he's done. Even the journey, it's not about what you were so strong to get through. It's about how strong he made you to get through it. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 through 11, always a dear passage to me. I could read it every day. Paul says, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. I want you to hear me. Some of you are like, I don't have anything else left. I don't have anyone else left and everything's falling apart. And God says, my grace is all you need. He says, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, you have, you have certain moments that sometimes just flood to you time and time again, just things that you experience and all with your life. And, and uh, one of those was, was, was just remembering what my dad said when we were trying to figure out what to do during COVID while he was battling cancer. And his only response was, he said, I don't know what you need to do, son, but what I know you should do is don't waste this year. Whatever you do, don't waste this year. That was coming from a dying man's perspective. But he also battled with my, my dad's former Marine. Always been tough as nails. In fact, if I, if I, if I, had, to, if I had to choose between a, uh, a, a killer dog on a chain versus my daddy on the chain when he's on the health, I'm putting my daddy on that thing for security. 
But my dad struggled to see his weakness. And I could tell. I said, well, Daddy, I've experienced weakness longer than you. And I had to just learn how to be okay with that. See, sometimes we don't, we don't want people to see us cry. We don't want people to see us struggle. We don't want to tell anybody that we are having a hardship about something. And I just want you to understand, at least when you're talking to me, um, join the crowd. There is grace. Listen, but by the grace of God, where would any of us be? But by the grace of God, how would we ever get through the things that life throws at us? I mean, I, I really believe I could go through row after row after row and I'd see miracle after miracle after miracle that you're still breathing, that you're still believing, that you're still pressing forward, that you are still walking with God. Today, as you bow your heads with me, I want you to just, just breathe this in and I want you to breathe it in with your heart and I want you to know that God wants to use your hardship to wake you up spiritually. He's wanting to wake up other people that might be attached to this as well. You not only need to be praying for God to work in you, but to work on and in them. God wants to, to draw you closer, not beyond the storm. Don't tell God, well, God, if you fix this or you change that or you do this, then, then I'll walk with you. you. You need to walk with him now because you're not going to be able to walk through what you're walking uh, through without him. You're not going to ever get to the other side. You need to know that God is at work. He is, he is growing your faith roots deep. He is, he is working things in you right now that prepare you for what is next. He is, he is comforting you. He has comforted you through certain trials and taking you through certain hardships. So that for the rest of your life, you say, God, I'm going to make sure that I'm a vessel that you can help others who deal with that or similar struggle. Those are my mission, God. I know it. I'll make sure that I'll do to them as I would want someone to do to me. And then, God, I want you to get all the glory. Not just fix all the problems, but get all the glory for all things that you fix and all things that you've done, and all things that you're doing, and all things that you're going to do. Dear Heavenly Father, God, right now, I pray, Lord, there's not a person listening right now in this prayer that doesn't say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I believe in you, Jesus, that through your death, burial, and resurrection, that you paved the way for me to overcome sin, grave, and the death. Dear my Father, God, come into my heart, be my Savior, and be my Lord from this day forward. God, I pray that there's no one today that needs to reconnect and rededicate their life, that they won't decide today to do that. God, if there's someone who needs to take that next step in believer's baptism, God, I pray they will join us July 9th, 2 p.m. on a Sunday, God, at the river for our next baptism. I pray they'd tell us about that decision, Lord, so that they can have accountability that that's the next step. God, I want to thank you right now for what you're doing, what you've been doing. Lord, I feel you in this place today. God, this old altar, Lord, it is a place of grace, not shame, grace. And it's open arms, God, all around us. Lord, if there's somebody that needs to, to come to this altar, I pray they will, Lord, and there'll be someone that prays with them. God, if there's someone, Lord, who just needs to ask somebody next to them, please pray with me. Lord, I pray they won't leave away without feeling loved and prayed for. God, we give you this altar time, Lord. Lord, it doesn't matter a hill of beans what we said and what we've learned, Lord, if we don't respond to it by faith. So, I, God, I pray that all that you want done would be done. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Would you stand with us, please? This altar's open. I'm available to you.